Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element polonium. Given polonium is a highly radioactive element, I regret I don't have a sample to show you. Well, no, I actually don't regret that at all. Rather, this is a movie from Theodore Gray of a very small amount of polonium under a very thin layer of gold. The polonium here is invisible. Speaking of Theodore Gray, here we see his beautiful periodic table. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, PeriodicTable.com. Polonium is the 84th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 84 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. Because all polonium isotopes are short-lived, more on this in a bit, any naturally occurring polonium is only present today in minute quantities as the result of radioactive decay of longer-lived radioactive elements. More on this, too, in a bit. Here, we see a sample of uranite, also called pitchblende, a uranium oxide ore, inside of which you may find a few atoms of polonium, about 100 micrograms per metric ton of ore, or one part in 10 billion. So this is not a practical source of polonium. Polonium was discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in July of 1898. They were exploring the radioactivity of uranite, and once they removed the longer-lived uranium and thorium, found that a much more radioactive substance remained. From this residue, they separated out polonium, and five months later, they discovered radium. This month's element's etymology is simple. Polonium was named after Marie Curie's homeland, Poland. For their work in the field of radioactivity, Marie and Pierre were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903. Interestingly, the Curie's daughter, Irene, married Frederick Joliot, and they were the recipients of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1935. The Curie's other daughter, Eve, married a diplomat who became the director of the United Nations Children's Fund, and he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1965. Quite a family. As I mentioned, rather than mining and extracting polonium from ore, which isn't practical, polonium is produced in reactors by bombarding bismuth atoms with neutrons. We start with a nucleus of bismuth-209. It can absorb a neutron in the reactor and then becomes bismuth-210, which is itself radioactive with a half-life of only five days. The bismuth-210 decays by beta radiation, spitting out an electron, transforming the bismuth into polonium-210. Still, this is a slow, inefficient process, only producing small quantities. Estimates are the world produces around 100 grams of polonium per year, almost exclusively in Russia. 100 grams of polonium would be a cube only 2.22 centimeters on a side, less than an inch. And that's the entire world's production. Polonium is certainly the priciest element we've encountered so far, since it's only produced in reactors in very small amounts at great expense. It's worth almost $50 trillion per kilogram. Note that it would take 10 years of world production to produce a kilogram. I normally talk about the abundances of elements on this slide, but because of the short-lived radioactive nature of polonium, there's not much to say here. There's really none to speak of in the universe having all decayed away by now, and none in the sun. Likewise, none in meteorites, 
and really not enough in the earth to talk about except possibly the tiny amount resulting from the decay of other elements. More on that later. For some reason I'm not entirely clear on, there's the tiniest bit in the ocean, making up two ten quadrillionths of the oceans, the third rarest element there. And of course, there's only the amount of polonium in us we absorb from the environment, but essentially none. More on this too in a bit. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. 84 protons for polonium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different masses. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 42 known isotopes of polonium, and we've reached the portion of the periodic table where there are no stable isotopes. All the isotopes of polonium are radioactive. Furthermore, as we'll see in the next slide, all the half-lives of polonium isotopes are short enough that we don't find them in nature, except in microscopic amounts as decay products of other radioactive elements. More on that in a couple slides too. The word isotope comes from the Greek, isos meaning same or equal, and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of polonium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the isotopes of polonium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More on half-life in the next slide. The longest polonium half-life is polonium-209, with a half-life of only 124 years. Given the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and even the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, all the polonium has decayed away, except again for that tiny bit which is itself a daughter product of decay from higher up in the periodic table. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2 and we'll be doing a lot of dividing by 2. If we wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay and we'll have 512 atoms left. If we wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving us with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, we'll have about one one-thousandth of our original amount. By the way, Notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If we waited one more half-life, a remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Now, polonium-210, the most common isotope of polonium, decays by alpha particle radiation. An alpha particle is just a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. Alpha particles are one of the three main forms of atomic radiation. Alpha particles, because of their double positive charge, are very easy to stop. Even a sheet of paper will stop them. Beta particles are energetic electrons spat out of the nucleus. It might take a sheet of plastic or a thin metal to stop them. The last form of radiation, gamma rays, are a form of very energetic light. These are so penetrating, it might take a thick layer of lead to stop them. One way you can detect alpha particles is to observe tiny flashes of light they make as they hit a phosphorescent screen. This device is called a spintharoscope. 
It has a tiny bit of polonium or radium and a screen you observe through a magnifying glass. It's amazing to be able to see actual radiation from the alpha particles hitting the screen. In 1947, for a Kix cereal box top and 15 cents, you could get your own spintharoscope in the form of an atomic bomb ring. This had a tiny, tiny sample of polonium. You took off the tailpiece and looked through the magnifying glass at the, quote, atoms splitting to smithereens, unquote. Atomic fission, the same as in the atomic bomb. I want to show you the decay series that leads from uranium to polonium, and ultimately lead, and I want to do it on a chart you'll see in many physics texts. We're only using a very small portion of a much larger chart. On this chart, the horizontal axis shows how many protons plus neutrons are in the nucleus. This is related to the atomic weight of the isotope. The vertical axis is the number of protons in the nucleus, its atomic number. Since the atomic number also tells us what element we're dealing with, each row is one unique element. Generally speaking, when an isotope decays, it can do this by emitting an alpha particle or a beta particle, and I'm oversimplifying this. An alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons, four particles in total. So, if we start with something like radium-226, it has uh, 88 protons, by the way. All radium isotopes have 88 protons. Radium-226 decays by alpha emission, meaning it loses two protons and two neutrons, four particles in total. This means we need to move two rows down for the two protons and four rows to the left for four total particles. You can see we arrive at radon-222. Okay, this is the move for alpha decays. What about betas? Here, one of the neutrons in the nucleus becomes a proton and an electron, and the electron is spit out of the nucleus as a beta particle. This means the nucleus gains a proton, but does not change its atomic weight. This time, we'll start with thorium-234. Gaining a proton, but not changing atomic weight, moves us up one row. And we now have a new element, protactinium, but with the same weight, 234. This is what beta decay looks like on our chart. Now, let's look at the complete uranium decay chain. We'll start with the most common uranium isotope, uranium-238. U-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. I've listed the half-lives at the top, but I'm not going to recite them anymore. Uranium-238 decays by alpha into thorium-234. Thorium-234 decays by beta, remember we move up one square for betas, into protactinium-234. That decays by beta into uranium-234. Note this uranium is a different isotope than the one we started out with. Uranium-234 decays by alpha into thorium-230, again, a different isotope than the thorium before. Thorium-230 decays by alpha into radium-226, which decays by alpha into radon-222, which decays by alpha into polonium-218. This very short-lived polonium-218 decays by alpha into lead-214. This is a radioactive form of lead, which decays by beta to bismuth-214, which decays by beta into polonium-214, which almost immediately decays by alpha into lead-210, another radioactive form of lead, which decays by beta to bismuth-210, which decays by beta to polonium-210, our third isotope of polonium from the decay of uranium-238, 
This polonium finally decays by alpha into lead 206, which is stable and not radioactive. Quite a roller coaster ride from uranium to lead, passing through three isotopes of polonium. Since Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and the half life of uranium 238 is also 4.5 billion years, about one half of the uranium 238 on Earth has decayed to lead. There are other decay chains that also account for other polonium isotopes, but I think I've made my point. Polonium has a fairly high density at 9.196 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of only 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you here. As you can see, polonium's density is slightly less than last month's element, bismuth. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself in my live talks. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, Polonium's density is 9.196 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle. Given polonium's highly radioactive nature, I will not be adding a block of this element to my collection. And even if I wanted to, since it's made artificially in a reactor, it would cost me an astonishing $86 trillion. Incidentally, that cube would weigh one and three quarters of a kilogram. Not that it means much, because you'll never see a lump of polonium, but like our previous element bismuth, polonium has a very low melting temperature, only 254 degrees Celsius, or 489 degrees Fahrenheit. It has the 25th lowest melting point, and 12 of those 25 melt below room temperature. If you were suicidal, you could easily melt this stuff on your stove. Polonium boils at a low 962 degrees Celsius, or 1,764 degrees Fahrenheit, giving it the 75th highest boiling point, or the 25th lowest boiling point, of all the elements. That's only 708 degrees Celsius above its melting point, giving it the 64th largest liquid temperature range of all the elements. One of the subscribers to this channel, SillySad3198, thought it might be nice to see a graph of liquid temperature ranges from highest to lowest, so here it is. The widest liquid temperature range is of Neptunium, with a 3,356 degrees Celsius liquid temperature range. This goes all the way down to Neon, which is liquid only in a 2.51 Celsius range. Again, polonium has the 64th narrowest liquid range at 708 degrees Celsius, near the bottom of the ranges. Notice all the noble gases, and hydrogen, have very small liquid temperature ranges. If we compare the size of the polonium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The polonium atom is about two and a half times the size of hydrogen. Here's its electron structure. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are dreadfully small. Looking at all the atom sizes, here we see them sorted from largest, cesium at the top left, to smallest, helium on the bottom right. Polonium has the 58th largest size atom of the elements, between gallium and antimony. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. If you excite atoms, they give off specific colors of light. Polonium has a relatively simple visible spectrum. Let me increase the contrast to emphasize the lines. If you could place polonium salts in a flame, these are the colors you would see in a spectroscope just before your inevitable death. 
With no red color in its spectrum, the flame would probably look cyanish or turquoise in color. This spectrum uniquely identifies the element as polonium to scientists, though they probably use other less dangerous methods. No other element gives off this set of colors. Let's take a look at a few applications of polonium because there aren't many. This is a bit of polonium used as a radioactive source. It's made by taking a strip of silver, plating a layer of bismuth on the silver, and then plating a very thin layer of gold on top of that. You place this strip in an intense neutron source, turning some of the bismuth into polonium. This is very clever since it traps the super toxic polonium between the silver strip and the gold plating where it can't get out into the environment. For some reason in the 1940s and early 50s, Firestone produced a spark plug with a bit of polonium impregnated into the sparking tip. The rationale was, I suppose, the ionization of gas from the alpha radiation would make ignition easier. However, because of polonium's short half-life and the quick buildup of alpha-blocking residue, any radioactive benefit would be gone in a month or less. I guess it was a good marketing ploy, however. A small amount of polonium goes a long way. If you could obtain a small one gram sphere of polonium, you can't, it would be only six millimeters in diameter, a little bigger than a BB, but it would give off so much radiation in the form of alpha particles, it would heat up red hot to a temperature of around 500 degrees Celsius or 932 degrees Fahrenheit and would be giving off 140 watts of heat. It would be so radioactive, it would ionize the air surrounding it, bathing it in an eerie blue glow. This type of radioactive heating has been used in spacecraft, such as the Soviet Lunacode rovers, which landed on the moon way back in 1970 and 1973. Okay, they actually didn't move that fast. To keep the electronics and batteries from freezing during the long two-week lunar night, these rovers had small one-watt polonium-based heaters. These sources only provided heat, the electricity to charge the batteries came from the solar cells inside the lid of the rover. Though not polonium, this is a red-hot pellet of plutonium-238, not the stuff in an atomic bomb, which is plutonium-239. This forms the basis for powering and heating of spacecraft we've sent out to the outer solar system. Here, the radiation heat is used to generate electricity as well as to keep the spacecraft electronics at working temperature. Polonium can't be used for these outer solar system missions because of polonium's short 138-day half-life. These missions last for many years, and plutonium's 87.7-year half-life is much more suited to the mission. Research and educational sources of low intensity are available encapsulated in plastic buttons. These are normally very weak sources usable in the classroom or for calibration purposes. Due to the intense alpha radiation emitted by polonium, it makes a good source of ions that can help eliminate static charges on surfaces. Here, you see a polonium-containing static eliminator button and static master brushes that contain a replaceable cartridge with a bit of polonium. Since the polonium only emits alpha particles, these are safe to use since the radiation does not even penetrate the epidermis layers of your skin. These brushes are not cheap, however, and will set you back a minimum of $170. And remember, with its short half-life, you'll have to replace that $109 polonium cartridge once a year. I have one right here in front of me. This is a Static Master brush, and here you can see the polonium cartridge right there. 
This one was manufactured, as you can see, in February of 1985, and I have some thoughts about that. Okay, this got me curious. After all this time, I guarantee there's not even one atom of polonium left in my brush. But how much polonium would I have needed in February 1985 to end up with one atom at the time of this video in September 2024? Well, let's see. There's 14,457 days, plus or minus, between those two dates. Polonium 210's half-life is 138 days, so that's over 104 half-lives. To find the original amount, I'd have to double our last remaining atom in 2024 over 104 times. That means I'd have to start with 2 to the power of 104.48 atoms. That's 2.83 times 10 to the 31st atoms. Okay, divide by Avogadro's number to find the number of moles and multiply that by the atomic weight, 210, to find the number of grams. That's 9.87 billion grams or 9.87 million kilograms of polonium. That much polonium would be a block 10.23 meters on a side. Can you imagine how hot that would be, giving off 1.38 trillion watts or 1.38 terawatts of heat? The entire world only produces about 2.4 times that energy. Of course, that's the energy at the beginning, which would exponentially decay to nothing from 1985 to today. Aren't calculations fun? As I just mentioned, polonium is not a real dangerous issue externally, unless it's a huge source. Alpha particles are easily stopped by the dead skin cells of the epidermis and is not an external hazard. Not only that, because of the high charge on the alpha particle, they're extremely short range. They only travel a couple centimeters in air. I don't have a polonium alpha source, but listen to the activity of the Geiger counter as I approach the americium-241 alpha source of this smoke detector. You really only get activity very close to the source. However, if an alpha source, such as polonium-210, somehow gets inside you, the alpha particle radiation is a severe hazard as it encounters live cells. Here, the alpha particles can ionize and damage delicate biological mechanisms in the cell, disrupting function or mutating DNA in the nucleus. A high enough exposure can even result in death. Which brings us to Alexander Litvinenko. He was a former Russian FSB officer who defected to Britain. He was an outspoken critic of Vladimir Putin and worked with British intelligence after he defected. On November 1st, 2006, he fell ill and was hospitalized. It was determined he was poisoned by a lethal dose of polonium-210. He died 22 days later. It was concluded his poisoning was carried out by his former employer, the FSB, and specifically by Andrei Lugovoy, probably under orders from Putin. One gram of polonium-210 is enough to kill 50 million people. Alexander Litvinenko was probably killed by only a millionth of a gram, or one microgram, of polonium, or even less. Polonium obviously serves no biological purpose, quite the opposite as we've just seen. So you'll find none of this element inside us, aside from what you may take in through smoking, which is one of the major ways we encounter this element. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about polonium. 
hidden in pitch blend, gleaned by Marie and Pierre, their radiant child. In the next program in this series, I'll examine the element astatine, an element with absolutely no practical uses. I hope you'll join me. It will probably be a pretty short presentation. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. And by the way, this is not a coin made from polonium, but rather a commemorative Polish coin celebrating the 100th anniversary of polonium's discovery by Marie and Pierre Curie. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element polonium.